So here it is guys, week two of More Than Enough, taken by our very own senior leader, Mark Pomery. Well hey there Elevate friends and family, great to have you with us and a special shout out to those of you joining us for the very first time. Now, some of you were with us last week and uh, for those of you that weren't, let me catch you up. Uh, we're in February right now, February 2024, and last week we kicked off the launch of a brand new generational opportunity. This is a little bit of a graphic to reflect that. It's our time to pioneer, to pioneer again. And really this uh, draws on the reality that as Elevate Church, which by the way, we are now in our 74th year, uh, pioneering has been a hallmark of that, basically that entire nearly three quarters of a century. Beginning back in 1950, where this group of people who called themselves the Wayside Sunday School, or effectively launched the Wayside Sunday School, gathered under a tree in the suburb here in Perth that we now have our church main facilities, uh, basically because, it, it, and we don't even know who these people are. We don't know their names. We don't know their backgrounds. We basically just have this photo, but these were a group of people as best as we can tell, who just kind of gathered and said, look, uh, there's kids that need to hear about Jesus. And we've got no building, no budget, but it's no problem because pioneers forge ahead. Pioneers go first. Pioneers take new ground. And then we've seen uh, various iterations of more pioneering uh, really, which stepped up in a pretty dramatic way in the 1980s, where the church, and talking specifically about buildings, which is not the only way a church pioneers, of course, uh, but in the case of buildings, in the 1980s, the, the church uh, purchased properties adjacent to the main church facilities, expanding the footprint, opening up future opportunities, and built what's now our current auditorium. Just a little kind of glimpse of that here, which the auditorium was launched in 1989. So now in 2024, when we gather in person here in Perth, we gather in those facilities that were pioneered decades ago. And it's tempting or, or could be tempting for us to settle. You know, thanks, pioneers. We appreciate you. You're amazing. Your sacrifice is incredible. Uh, we're, so, we're so grateful. Uh, and we're just going to settle. Which is tempting because, let's face it, settling is easier. Settling is more comfortable. But the problem with settling is settlers don't take new ground. Pioneers, on the other hand, they see what could be. They look to possibilities and they roll up their sleeves and do whatever it takes to take that new ground, seize that new opportunity. We did a little bit of that in 2015. There was another property adjacent to our church facilities that, that came up and uh, we purchased that in 2015 for just under a million dollars. That allowed us to today have this footprint. This is 6,000 square meters, just five minutes from the Perth center. And this, this would be virtually impossible to procure if we wanted to kind of come in today. In fact, it likely wouldn't even exist. And yet through these various generations of pioneers, we now enjoy this. Now, here's the thing. We purchased this final residential property for just under a million dollars. We borrowed from the bank. We have a loan. The loan balance is now only $700,000, which is pretty good having purchased the property for a million dollars. But we really feel God calling us to aggressively attack that loan. We've been paying off the payments just like sort of standard payments to the bank. We want to aggressively attack that loan. And by aggressively attacking it, it opens up a whole raft of wins. It opens up wins like ownership. You know, when you own or have greater ownership, 
in your facilities, you get to make decisions. You aren't subject to somebody else putting limitations on you. And we don't have a, a clear blueprint of what the opportunities look like. Uh, we're kind of open to God continuing to lead us, but we want to position ourselves to be able to seize those opportunities and take even more new ground and, and redirect money that we, that's currently going to the bank to ultimately release those financial resources to ministry because that's ultimately what we as a church are called to do. Ministry, reach people and build people. So through these few weeks of February, we're coupling this launch of pioneering again with a series called More Than Enough. And the big idea around this More Than Enough is to appreciate that God is not not enough, not just enough, but ultimately he is more than enough. And when we get that revelation, that'll help us move from a scarcity mindset, never enough, barely enough, a self-reliant mindset, mind you, to an abundance mindset that because we are sons and daughters of the King, sons and daughters of the God who is more than enough, we can live out of faith, not out of fear, out of God-reliance, not self-reliance. We want to move towards faith-raising around pioneering again, not fundraising, because faith-raising will spill over into all areas of our lives. And so for these few weeks, Around this series, More Than Enough, we're looking at two chapters of a letter that Paul wrote, Paul, one of the early leaders in the church, to a church in a place called Corinth in modern-day Greece. And uh, in these two chapters, he had a lot to say about generosity. So if you've got your smartphone camera, how about you scan this flow code? And it's going to take you to the first of these two chapters. Second... Corinthians chapter 8. And while you're doing that, let me give you some context. Now, Paul was previously a Jewish leader. He met Jesus, transformed his life essentially, you know, overnight and became a leader within the early church. Now, the early church was almost, well, was actually exclusively aimed towards Jewish people. Jesus had come and inserted himself amongst the Jewish people and, uh, Initially, they kind of rested on the idea that the good news about Jesus was actually for the Jewish people, that he was the Savior and Messiah for the Jewish people. But then they kind of started to think, maybe we should be taking this good news beyond the Jewish people, into the non-Jewish world, the group that they called the Gentiles. And so they did precisely that. They started preaching the good news about Jesus into non-Jewish regions of the known world, including this church in Corinth. Um, and uh, we talked about this last week, that in this chapter, chapter 8, Paul started to write this chapter to the church in Corinth, actually bragging about the church in Macedonia. And he highlighted the fact that the church and the people in Macedonia, they were actually facing many troubles, and yet somehow contrary to that, they were filled with abundant joy, and that they were very, very poor, and yet they overflowed with rich generosity. And these things seem to be contradictions, but what we can lean into is the reality that these Macedonian Jesus followers were living out of an abundance mindset, not a scarcity mindset. They weren't allowing themselves to be limited by circumstances and self-reliance, but instead to lean into and place their faith into a God who is more than enough. Now, Paul then, having kind of bragged on the generosity of the church in Macedonia, shifts gears to remind the church in Corinth that they initially had committed to being generous. And in fact, not just 
committed to being generous. They'd actually started in a journey and their journey of generosity, but for some reason, they stopped. They had good intentions, but they were short on the follow through. And I just want to kind of ask you the question, and I don't say this judgmentally, but I'm just kind of putting in there, have you ever been in that situation where you thought about giving, thought about being generous, had good intentions, but ultimately didn't follow through? Well, this is Paul writing, continuing this letter. So we've urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. I want to highlight two things. The first one's kind of obvious. Paul's saying like, hey, team, finish what you started. Follow through on your commitment. The second one is maybe easy to kind of blow past. It's this idea that he refers to giving as a ministry, not simply an act. And I wonder if you've ever considered that, if that's ever been, because look, when we think of ministry, there's some usual suspects that rise to the surface. You know, things like preaching, what I'm doing now, that's ministry. Uh, prayer, praying for people, that's ministry. Uh, leading, leading people, that's ministry. Serving, serving and elevate kids, serving and elevate youth, serving in any one of our incredible elevate teams, yeah, that's ministry. Well, Paul adds giving, into this very same list. He's making the point that giving is incredibly spiritual. Then he continues, well, since you excel in so many ways, the, these ministry areas like your faith and you've got gifted speakers and your knowledge of God and his word and how he operates, your enthusiasm, your love from us or your love for us, some translations say, say, I want you to also like add to the list of things to excel in, add the gracious act of giving to things you excel in. Now, when we look at this list, you know, things like faith and knowledge of God and love for other people, there's a chance that you've actually made some level of commitment in your past to get better at those things. But I wonder if you've ever taken the conscious and made the conscious decision to get better at giving, to excel in this ministry of giving. Well, I want to invite you to consider that today. To, to put this on your list of things that you want to actually grow in and ultimately become phenomenal in. But here's the reality. It's almost impossible to become great at anything without practice, without actually doing it. Intentions are a good starting point, but they're not the finish line. You have to put them into practice, and you know how important this is. If you go into a restaurant, you want the chef to be the one preparing the meal, not discovering that the chef's sick and so the person that usually does the dishes who's never touched a chef's knife in their life, they're going to have a go tonight. You don't want to know that. You don't want to get onto a crowded bus and discover that the bus driver thinks today's a good day for his 15-year-old unlicensed son to have a go. It's his birthday. You don't want to be admitted into hospital for surgery and discover that it's the janitor's 10th anniversary of working at the hospital, so they're going to let him have a crack at surgery today. No, you, you want to know that the person that's doing the thing has had a lot of practice and got better and better and now excels in that thing. Well, the same goes with giving. You and I will never become great at giving without actually practicing giving. And this requires a plan. This requires a conscious plan 
What are you going to do? What is that going to look like? What is, what is this practice of giving going to look like every day, every week, every month, every payday? Every, what's it going to look like? Like actually in reality, what's it going to look like? And then a commitment to consistently executing that plan. You know, one of my life verses is something that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah. And he said this, generous people plan to do what's generous. And they stand firm in their generosity. This concept of planning is not a foreign concept. You've probably planned a party, a, a vacation, maybe planned a renovation for, for your home or a space in your home. But have you ever sat down and crafted a generosity now, we talked about this in the third message of our January series, You'll Be Glad You Did. It's a message called Live Generous, where we basically, one of the things that we did is we sliced and diced the difference between being generous, you know, sporadic, spontaneous, random acts of giving, and then this idea of living generous, this commitment to a plan and a consistency and an ongoing lifestyle of generosity. See, being generous is an action, but living generous is a mindset. So I just want to keep walking through this letter that Paul wrote and highlighting a couple of things that he underlined that are hallmarks of people who live generously. The first one is he says that generous people give willingly. It's not guilted, shamed, coerced, cajoled, badgered. Give willingly. This is what Paul wrote last year, saying to the church in Corinth, you were the first who wanted to give. And you were the first to begin doing it, like they got started. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now. By your giving. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. He's pointing to the reality that God's not just interested in the act of giving and the act of generosity. He's really zoomed in on the heart of generosity. And you know this, and particularly if you're a parent or you've raised kids, you know this. Whenever you've asked Junior to share something or give something, and they've said to you, uh, do I have to? And you're like, yeah, you have to. But, but what you really want them to respond with, and, and by the way, if and when they get to this place, you want them to be saying, sure, I'm, I'm happy to. I'd love to. And in fact, if and when Junior gets to that place, you know Junior's grown. Well, that's exactly the same for us. Is it, there's an actual measurable metric that we're growing when we move from a reluctance, oh, okay, I suppose, do, do I have to, to a, man, I can't wait to. I, I, I'm eager to. I, I love to. I, I get to do this, not I got to do this. So generous people give willingly. And then Paul moves on to talk about the reality that generous people give proportionately. And this is a principle that you will see all through the Bible. When God talks about giving, he talks about percentage or proportionate giving. This is Paul continuing on. Give in proportion to what you have and giving according to what you have, not what you don't have. There should be some equality. And Paul's talking when he talks about equality and proportion, he's saying that not we're not all called to give the same dollar amount, but God wants us to give the same proportion, give the same sacrifice, give the same percentage. This idea that God's actually kind of more moved by percentage giving than a specific amount. For example, let's say two people both give $1,000. 
to the thing. And then we learned that person A earns $500,000 a year. And person B earns the average Australian wage of $70,000 a year. Which person gave more? Because remember, they both gave $1,000. Well, according to this principle of proportionate giving, person B gave more. They gave $1,000 out of their $70,000 income, and this person gave $1,000 out of their $500,000 income. So... I want to encourage you to prioritize proportionate giving into your plan. This is something that Louisa, my wife, and I have been doing for several decades now. We have a percentage. In fact, it started somewhere. It's now a higher percentage. But it's a percentage. And that's a decision we've made. We just we made it once. We don't make it every time we, we get paid. We've made it once. And when money comes our way, every fortnight through pay, for example, we give that percentage. And we're committed to, hey, God, grow our faith and, and, and trust in you. And, and we've continued to increase that percentage. And we have no plans on pulling the handbrake on. We're going to just, God, take us as far as you want to take us. And we're just going to go on that journey with you. And then there's this idea that, there's a level above this, and that's generous people give sacrificially. This is like giving beyond what's easy or what's comfortable. This is the kind of giving that pioneers lean into with their time, their talents, and their financial resources. This giving level is the one that's like, oh, I felt that. Or uh, we're feeling that. But it's worth it. And all the while, while you're feeling the pinch of that, you know that the same God who's more than enough, who's got you to that point, is going to continue to be more than enough for you as you level up and give sacrificially. So here's what I want to invite you to do. Very simply, go to our website, elevatechurch.me. Scroll to the very, very bottom. There's a contact us link. Click that link and hit us up and say, I'd like to know more about pioneering again. I mean, count me in. Uh, and, 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 and I will personally send you the information. It's not an invoice. We're not going to come looking for you. It's about giving you an opportunity to pioneer again to build on the Wayside Sunday School in 1950, to build on the pioneers in 1980s, and to position us to say, God, we want to take advantage of every opportunity that you put in front of us from this day forward. And we're going to position ourselves to do that by aggressively attacking this debt and taking greater ownership of the property resources that you've entrusted to us. So I can't wait to hear from you. I can't wait to get back in touch with you. I can't wait to continue this journey with you. And we're going to pick this up again next week with this series, More Than Enough, and with more inspo around what it looks like to pioneer again. God bless you. See you then. And don't forget to bring somebody.